culture gene. And he's the author of two books, Culture Decks Decoded, as well as Own Your Culture, How to Define, Embed, and Manage Your Company Culture. Brent, how's it going today? Anthony, really good. Thanks. Really good. I uh, managed to get a good night's sleep with a one-year-old and a three-year-old. That's pretty important. But um, yeah, good. Thanks. I've had a good day. That's awesome. I find it so interesting as I evolve in my age and in my uh, experience as a consultant, recognizing that, you know, people have these like the work that they do, they're like CEO hat, VP hat, et cetera. And then at home, they're just easily as exhausted have, you know, there's the personal side and the CEO side to life. And I, and I find that very interesting, but, um, but tell me more about, um, about you, your background, you know, what might people not know about you that they can't read from your website or some of the blogs that you've posted. So I, um, uh, I actually recently moved to Portugal um, during the lockdown. My wife and I decided, uh, let's go where the sun shines a little bit more. Um, and our kids are young enough to, for them to not be in the schooling system. So, yeah, we've moved to Portugal. Other than that, I, I run Culture Gene, which is my passion. I was lucky enough to find my passion. And it's, uh, you know, doing what I do is very much, I'm, I'm going to do this until the day I die. Um, it's just the thing I, I love doing and I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, we help companies define, embed, and um, manage their culture. And uh, I, I spend about 20% of my time talking to companies and talking to leaders um, because I'm, that's the, the best way for me to learn. So I, I'm a student of culture, and uh, some people might say I'm an expert of <laughs> well, for the next 40 minutes or so, you're definitely the expert here. Um, but I'm, I'm actually curious about your journey, by the way, if anybody's trying to look him up online, it's Breton, but we'll call him Brent for short, and you can check out his website there. Um, it, how did, so if we look at the back of your career, or the front end of the career more precisely, it looks like you were involved in a lot of different industries in emerging technologies. So before we get into the sort of the expertise that you have in culture right now, can we speak to, you know, how that learning journey was in that, in the emerging technologies in the early 2000s? Yeah. So I, um, prior to setting up Culture Gene, I ran a, an executive search firm where we helped high growth companies expand their leadership teams. And uh, we worked anywhere between Moscow and San Francisco, um, mainly UK and US, helping companies expand both ways. And so I did a lot of work with companies that were in the formative stages of you know, building their teams, but ultimately building their culture. Um, and I, I was lucky enough really to work with three companies almost in a row where the CEOs had a very clear understanding of their culture. And I was, so I was asked to find candidates in those searches where the candidates had a very clear um, fit with the skills and experience required, but also a fit with the values of the company. And that was where the penny really dropped for me was um, seeing that search process run that much more smoothly and seeing, watching the candidate interviews where you could just see whether values match was really good. It was just that it was, it was almost as if they'd been dancing tango for 10 years. Mm. And then actually seeing the impact that the candidates had on the companies once they joined them, I, it was like, wow, okay, this is where I, th there is a really big thing here. And that's where I started researching and digging into company culture, uh, building my processes and what I use with my clients now. And I started interviewing um, leaders of high growth companies to really understand how they embed and manage their company culture. And that's where the two books came from. That's awesome. So, I mean, we haven't actually spoken really with anybody who's a recruiter, but, you know, one of the times people look at like culture and I think it's shifting around being like a soft skill, you know, like it's a nice to have versus a must have. And then when you look at like strategy and, and leadership effectively, it's sometimes hard for people to place an ROI on, on having that culture piece. So from the recruiting lens, you know, what would be the ROI for a company of either keeping or the cost of having to hire. So what is that ROI of, and the practical ROI of being good at having people stay in your company? So the, the companies that I worked with couldn't afford to make the wrong decision. 
you know, in, in larger organizations, you can hire the, long, the wrong director, and after six months, you work out they're wrong, and you, you then go through the process of hiring another one. But actually, that business, although that department may struggle a little bit, the business continues. But if you're working in a 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 person organization, and you hire the new VP of engineering, and that VP of engineering is toxic or the wrong fit with the values of the company, you can break the entire company. So the ROI in terms of in terms of finding the right skills and experience is obvious and clear, but actually finding the right fit, fit with the values means that this person gets your culture and can actually add to your culture, is additive towards your culture, and so can speed things up. Culture essentially is the oil between the, the cogs of the engine. And so the more oil you have, the, 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 the faster the chance of the better the oil you have, the, the, the faster your engine can operate versus slowing you down if you've got the wrong oil or the wrong lubricant in there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we saw um, situations where this person not only did the job, but fundamentally changed the way the organization operated and fundamentally changed the speed with which they operated and pushed it even faster. So the ROI was very, very clear. And it was, it's not just in the, you know, it costs, I don't know, it costs 100 grand um, in fees and time to, to employ a, a VP in a, in a, in a well-funded uh, VC-backed organization. You know, it's not just that where you don't have to do that multiple times by, because you've got to replace somebody. It's actually the impact on the business because it, at that early stage, the impact is so extreme and so, so, so much greater than in a bigger organization. Mm. It's in, and it's interesting. Well, thank you for reframing that for me because, you know, being like looking at it as just like the hard costs and saying, okay, great. Yes, it's a hundred grand, which is nothing to sneeze at like a hundred grand. You know, some people that's, that's all of their retained earnings, depending on the size of business. Whereas, you know, what, what you're highlighting here is, you know, adding the right hire or not, or adding the wrong hire will cost you infinitely more in, in productivity and especially with those, you know, high growth companies um, that are really trying to do something fast. It will either be the rocket fuel or oil or the, the roadblock. So um, what do you say about, you know, the importance of having fit and culture for, let's say, a 300 person organization where there's, you know, different levels, different teams and having the right sort of mix of people in order to to support that? How do you find that the dichotomy or, or balance works differently? So the first thing, the first thing to say is that it's impossible to to find culture fit. Um, the reason why it's impossible to find culture fit is because no CEO I've ever asked the, this question to has been able to answer. How can you accurately can you accurately define your culture to me, please? And if you can accurately define your culture, then you can hire for culture fit. But you, but essentially, it's not possible because. The, the culture, your culture is changing all the time and your culture is this invisible, subconscious, intangible thing that consists of good and bad, but very random behaviors, habits, norms, principles, beliefs, communication styles that are developed over a period of time. And they change over time. So when you were 10 people, then when you were 30 people, or well, now you're 150, now you're 300, your culture's changing all the time. So hiring, even trying to hire for culture fit, actually means it's just a fancy way of saying I'm hiring for gut instinct. And gut instinct is not reliable, it's completely biased invariably, and it's not scalable. So, so hiring for gut instinct or culture fit is the wrong way to hire or to try and hire. You should rather hire for values fit because values are more consistent. Values are more consistent across the organization even in a 300 person organization, you will have subcultures forming. You may have the French team, you may have the engineering team, you may have the people who play Dungeons and Dragons in the evening or play games in the evening. There are different subcultures that form and that's fine, as long as your values are consistent across the organization. And as long as you are hiring for values fit and re recognizing when values are lived and when you are rewarding when values are lived, then you get this consistency. That's really the, 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 you know, it doesn't matter what size organization, you still have to hire for the fit with the values of the organization. So it's an interesting, so given that, that we're not hiring for culture and we're hiring for values, speak to me about the importance 
of culture decks and and how does that culture deck play into being able to communicate formulate give a archetype or framework for how organizations want their culture and values communicated and embraced uh, up taken up on yeah so culture decks are a really great way of communicating your culture broadly the the fundamentals the really fundamental principles of or not principles but foundations of a culture are values mission and vision but a culture deck goes beyond that. It, 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 it'll describe your diversity and inclusion. It'll describe how you work. It'll describe what you do when it comes to feedback, what you do when it comes to mistakes. Um, a, a good culture deck will, you, you know, will, will go into great detail about how you work. So I, I, when I wrote Culture Decks Decoded, it actually came as a result of, of writing a blog post about the best culture decks on the web. And I included LinkedIn, Spotify, um, Netflix, Valve, HubSpot, Hootsuite, and, and, and many others. And that blog post to this day still gets the most reads of all my blog posts. And I, I, I thought, let me write an ebook about this. And I just started writing, and I, I'd, read, I'd read all these, de these culture decks. So I thought, I'll take the best slides and comment on them. And so I... I, I I started off just writing an ebook, but it just turned into a really easy book to write for me because book writing is not e uh, writing is hard, hard, hard work for me. And so I looked at the Netflix culture deck and I realized how well they communicate the, their culture. So they say we're a sports team, we're a pro sports team, we're not a business, and we're not a family. What that means is we expect excellence all the time. If you're not excellent, we'll put you on the bench. We'll train you and we'll get you back up to excellent. But if you can't get back up to excellent, we will fire you. They also say in the Netflix culture deck, we pay above market salary rates. We pay you what you're worth plus. Because we don't want to have a negotiation about your value. We think you're valuable. And actually, they actually encourage their employees in that culture deck to go and interview at competitors for the same role. And if you are offered more, they will just pay you more. Because hmm. it shouldn't be about the money. Because you are, an, you are a super sports star in their terminology. So it's a very clear way of, this is how we work, this is how we do things around here, and this is what we accept, this is what we don't accept, this is what we value, these are the behaviors. So a culture deck... Uh, the Netflix culture deck is 125 pages, and it's, I recommend everybody should read this. Should read the document because you just you work out. Wow, I would love to work there, or I wouldn't. It's 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 a powerful, magnetically powerful repulsor as well as attractor. It will repulse you if you don't want to work in a place like that. And that's exactly why Reed Hastings put it online because he was sick and tired of doing onboarding. And then after the onboarding process, half of the new joiners leaving because they didn't like the culture that he described to them. So he put it online so people can read it beforehand. So at least you know how, what you're getting into when you work at Netflix. So I love that. And I think it just it says here, here's what you can expect. It's, it's a process. You know, a lot of the people that we work with are small to medium enterprises. You know, our culture decks reserved for the multi-billion dollar company or can every organization any organization create their own version of a culture deck i think every organization should i think you've got to work out where you are in your in your process of, of defining your culture so often you know a couple of years in maybe you're 20 30 people things are starting to to, to take off you probably you may not have a you know, may not have defined what diversity and inclusion means to you. You should have done it, but you haven't done it. You may not have really thought about how you handle mistakes and feedback and how you deal, you know, you deal with misdemeanors. But you can start by defining your values and your mission and your vision. You can explain how you work and you can detail this in a 10 page deck or a 12 page deck. And then it will develop over time and will change over time as your culture changes. As more processes become important, you will maybe talk about those processes. As you learn what works and doesn't, what what doesn't learn in your organization, you will um, 
you will you, you will add that to the culture deck. So your culture deck is a living, breathing document that should be that should grow with you over time. Yeah, I love that because that was one of the questions I had when we talk about the values, the mission, and the vision, and, and looking forward. And then we look at things that are happening globally. We'll say, you know, there's COVID. There's the, you know, uh, I don't know how to even put it into words, but the shootings that are happening. There's the the you know challenges with diversity and inclusion, which doesn't even do it justice. There's you know like people's rights, like just everything going on. You know, how does one? <laughs> Uh, you know, in include that. Like, what is, you know, is it the CEO's job? Is it the HR manager's job? Is it everybody's job? And in, in, in how, what's the process for, you know, putting that in place? Is it just, hey, like, okay, we need to add a new section about diversity and inclusion, or we need to add a new section about land acknowledgement, we need to add a new section about this. Is that how you see or the businesses you work with applying it? Yeah, what, what we'll do is we will, we will, we will start with a framework. We'll, 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 we'll start with a framework and then we'll go to the company and say, who's got something to say on this? And then, and then we'll just get people to write stuff up in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Google Doc. You know, what have you got to say about this? What's important? What's not important? And then somebody will take responsibility of that um, particular subject or that particular area of, of that chapter and then and write it up. And then it becomes something that you do as part of the organization. You, you, there are certain elements that this invariably the vision is the CEO's vision. So the CEO deals with that. Um, and then depending on where we are in the process, HR or the people ops person may add piece on the values and behaviors. Um, one, you know, my clients, I, I really encourage them to sprinkle these documents with stories because we collect stories of people living the values and collect stories of people living the behaviors that are expected in the organization. And so when you read this document, you should be able to go, ah, okay, cool, I get it, because Jack in engineering did this and this and this, and that was amazing, and that's how that lived that behavior. And, you know, Maria in, in, in sales, um, you know, she's in, she, she went into her local community and did X, Y, and Z, and that community is really important to us. So you, you've got to, you, it, it, ideally, it's got to have life, it's got to have depth, it's got to have, um, uh, you, you, it's got to have soul, but if you look at the Netflix document, it's pretty black and white, bang, this is it. It really depends on your culture and how you work, but how I like, what I like to do is give it a little bit more so that people in, get a sense of the, a deeper sense of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense and actually make it well, reflective. So people can, that was, I guess, Reed's point was to say, hey, you're going to be able to get a sense of this. You're going to get, this is your free taste, your free sample of the organization. So read it and know right away. And then, you know, in the back of my mind, I have a question about like, you know, let's say you didn't have a culture document, you make one, but you have all of these employees who have been in the organization and, you know, maybe they don't want to live that way. Like maybe they turn out that they don't agree with the like we'll call it future direction or current direction of, of the values have you ever seen that i see that all the time because you you have what i call current values and aspirational values and often the current values are what's really happening on the organization and the aspirational values are what the leadership team would like or think or wishfully think that the, the values of the organization are and so i i what i see in this is um, there's that disconnect that happens where the leadership team decide to write this thing and the, the, the team go, wow, you guys are on crack. Um, but actually, the, the reality of the situation, what, what I do with my clients is we, I, I work out what the current values are and we work out what the aspirational values are and then we, we, we overlap them. We see where they overlap and we see which we want to retain. But in, in the current company values, there are always negative values or behaviors. So there's silo mentality, bottleneck thinking, lack of respect. There are various things that are in the organization because that develops as part of the, as the company develops. In the early days, it's let's just survive. And, and we're, not, we're not really concentrating on, you know, what's good behavior and bad behavior. And then that, some of that bad behavior gets just dragged along. And so if you step back and say, okay, your current, your current values have some negative elements to them and this is how we eliminate those or we eradicate those or we, we we put a muzzle on those 
then you can then you can start working but it's once again it's including the organization i don't I, you know i don't go to the, the leadership team and say what do you ladies and gentlemen think the current values are i go to the organization i say tell me what the what the current values are yeah, the yeah. folks in there. I, I I just have so many more questions. I want to dig into this, but I also want to ask you something different. But I really like that idea of like, I mean, just like looking forward and shaping that and getting to know like what's really happening versus what's actually happening. Um, uh, I, I want to ask you about remote work before it, you know, I'll just make sure if you have any questions that you want to ask, please put them in the chat. If you're on YouTube, please put them there. And if you haven't had a chance, just like and subscribe so you don't miss any future interviews. Um, we talked about, you know, how things have been and then looking at how things are going. How have you found the culture in the world of remote work. And I know you have a great sort of paragraph and 10 step process for how to maximize remote work, but how have you found, you know, that shift to remote work impacting um, the adherence to the values and, or, you know, creating a whole new subculture of, of work? Yeah, so there are two, there are two scenarios here. Um, in my book, um, Own Your Culture, I use Warren Buffett's quote where I say, Warren uh, uh, Buffett's uh, quote is, you only find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. Um, and basically, the, tide go, uh, the tide's gone out, and every single, the majority of leaders who didn't invest in their culture, um, they are the ones who are swimming around naked now. And they are really struggling with this transition because they don't have values. They don't have um, you know, the mission and the vision. They don't have the North Star. They don't have that glue that's keeping the team together. What is happening is because we're in this pandemic, everybody is just happy to have a job and we don't have anywhere to go. So we're working hard. So we do have we, we have this I, what I believe what I call a false productivity because I because I'm, you know, I get out of bed and I have a shower and I walk into my office and then I maybe even eat something at my desk and I work until nine or ten o'clock because I can't go out and party with my friends. So. So that, there's one element of it. On the other side, you've got companies that are adapting really well to this, and they are getting, they positioning themselves ahead of the curve. In other words, they're saying, we are going to be a hybrid work environment, and we're going to build a culture for that hybrid work environment, and we're going to be deliberate about that, which means that we're going to build the remote first working capabilities into our environment. And so I'm, and those are, there are not many of those companies, to be frank. Um, but what, what I'm seeing is companies that, uh, and you've, you've got it up on the screen now, companies that, are, that are, are looking at what remote companies do, because ultimately, I, if, if, I, if, I, if we run a hybrid environment, that means some people will work in the office, some people will work from home. And depending on the mix, that could be on Mondays and Wednesdays, or it could be all sorts of uh, permutations. But really what companies do, the hybrid companies are doing well now and they're doing it well is they, they're looking at the, the remote best practices. So communication, uh, structure, developing social connection. And they, they're working on these as almost company transformation because a lot of this stuff happened automatically as, as, as a function of being in an office. And we could be lazy about our culture because it happened as a byproduct of having these four walls around us. Now we're in a situation where we don't have those four walls and we don't have osmosis. We don't have informal communication. We don't have informal social gatherings. We don't have in, you know, those, those water cooler moments. And we have to make up for that now in our culture. So that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing 95% of the world's leaders have their heads in the sand and 5% are really reacting quite well. Yeah. And what I want to highlight here, I'm going to leave this up for a little bit and I'll, I'll put the link in the bio. So if you're watching this at home, you can, you know, see the, the thing is, you know, I want to sort of tie a couple of thoughts together because Brent and I have been chatting about culture and, and culture just as a, an idea. But we really started off today's episode saying culture is the thing that drives the business results. So if you're looking at as a do I focus on culture, or do I focus on the business? Your culture is the business. And if you just ignore it, then you're ignoring like really the arguably and, and Brett, you can agree with me or not, arguably the thing that is going to put the most oil or gas on the growth of your company. And so what what is out there is people have these strategic. Oh, by the way, I never actually let you agree or disagree with me. So I'll just do that now. 
I agree. <laughs> okay, perfect. I thought you might. Uh, that's my one flaw. I ask a question and I don't let people answer it. And then, and then we have like some people with like strategic plans that have been sort of historic or even done a year and a half ago. But if the the whole method, the whole approach to doing the work changes, you know, my assertion is that you need to address and refine and update your way to do the work, your processes, structure, system, communication, social, all of that stuff. Otherwise, your previous plan from a year and a half ago, two years ago, isn't going to cut it. Can you share how, how you've seen that application uh, move forward with teams in terms of adapting to these remote work best practices? Yeah, so so if you look at um, the, if you look at what companies are doing now to to help, because what what basically happened is we are being zoomed out, we're zoomified, um, and we don't we, we we're spending so much time on Zoom, we don't want to spend more time on Zoom, so we're not able to build that social connection. We're not we we're actually spending a lot of time on Zoom and then working until late at night because that's when we get our work done. And actually, the best companies are building in asynchronous communication methods inside their organization. They're building in documentation methods inside of their organization where they're giving just sort of basic fundamentals of let's now document what we need to document because if we have somebody joining us who, will, who won't meet us for the first three months, we have to communicate our culture. We have to communicate our processes. We have to communicate the way we work around it. If we don't, then they have to have a Zoom call to understand it. And so building in this asynchronous documented capability is, is really the, 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 the core part of, of, this, of this solution uh, of, of adapting to hybrid work. And I, I highly recommend, if you haven't had a chance um, to, to look at the GitLab company manual, I highly recommend you have a look at that. It's 8,100 pages if you printed it out. Um, but it's a thing of absolute beauty. It's a work of art, in my opinion. And it's, it, it's, it's used. Every single document, every single page is live and used regularly by the entire organization because they structure their documentation in a certain way and they work asynchronously. So I think that's, that's really the main area where I'm seeing companies adapting to quite quickly. It's not easy, but companies are adapting. Yeah, and when I yeah. think it's interesting, the use of not just remote work, but hybrid work, because some people are still fully in person and some people are still fully remote and then, you know, planning for now and not just the future. So um, anything else you wanted to add on that? No, I think the the reality is we're not going back to the way it was. There are maybe a handful of companies that will be able to tell their people, come in or you've gone. But ultimately, even Goldman Sachs are going to lose people because I know people who now have moved internationally because they don't, they don't need to be, they don't want to, to live the, the way they lived pre-COVID. And I just think leaders have to, have to really be thinking about more than hopefully we'll be able, I'll be able to lead the way I used to lead. That's not, that's not going to cut it in the new world. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I've got a couple of questions about your process and, and I'm just, uh, they're sort of, uh, what's it called? Leading questions. Cause I think I know the answer, but this is for our listeners is, you know, how important is it when you're going through the process of looking at where your company wants to go to define the vision and mission, even if you might've done it in the past before? Yeah. So some companies have a mission, some companies have a vision and some companies have a vision and mission. I believe that you need vision, mission, and values because your vision is your why, your mission is your what, and your values are your how. Why are we doing this? What are we doing to get there? And how do we behave? Vision, mission, and values. I think it's absolutely critical. And right now, it's, it's, it's something that really good leaders in this forced remote environment are talking about it a lot because they're reminding their people what we're doing here. Yes, this is tough. Yes, we're stressed. Yes, we've got anxiety. But we have got this mission or vision to fulfill. And that gets people back rowing in the right direction. Yeah, even if it's been done before, it's got to be done continuously because it's one of those things that people forget very easily. Yeah. <laughs> so we talk about, and, and again, on the, on the I think I might have put it in the chat and I'll share it. Step one, define and refine, which we've talked about. Step two, 
and stage two rather, embed. Can you speak to us a little bit about what are maybe two or three practical things leaders can do to embed culture into their workplaces? Sure, so there are, although culture is this complex, invisible, subconscious, intangible thing, there are only six ways to embed company culture. So from a leadership point of view, it's, this, is, this is kind of like a framework for how to lead your business. Those, the six ways to embed company culture are what you measure and pay attention to, how you hire, fire, and promote, how you train, mentor, and educate, where you invest and allocate resources, how you behave in crisis situations, and how you reward or recognize. So let me give you a quick example. If, you, if the CEO says customer support is really critical, customer, customer support is our thing, we've got to do it, but the CEO doesn't reward and recognize any great customer support initiatives. They don't invest the software for customer support. Instead, they invest in sales. They don't measure customer support and they brush a crisis under the carpet. Everybody knows that the CEO is talking nonsense and is dis there's a disengagement with the culture because you're not using those six embedding factors. People watch how you behave more than your wife or partner watches how you behave in an organization. Yeah, I got that. I, I find it such an interesting point where the, the what you say versus what you do and your actions will speak much louder than words. And they don't have to be big actions. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's the little things, just the one or two things sprinkled in as a, as a process, like put it in your calendar. It could be 15 minutes long. That will pay huge, huge dividends. A, a, a good example from um, from my book is uh, there's a guy named Martin Ruhrink who um, he, he ran a business called Gideon in the Netherlands and one of their values was transparency and randomly one of the one of his colleagues junior colleagues came up and said Martin what do you what do you do in um, uh, what do you guys talk about in that uh, uh, management meeting and it, he was like shocked because he thought oh gosh if we are going to be transparent then people need to know what we're talking about. So he actually went to that person and said, would you mind coming in and sitting in our management meetings? The only requirement is that it's on Monday, every Monday, and you have to write up a summary of what we talk about. And so he realized the mistake he was making. He wasn't embedding transparency all the way through the organization. And so he undid it and reinforced it and embedded it again. So I have a question on that about transparency and openness and leadership and communication and all the good things that make culture great. How have you seen uh, the relationship between boards and the leadership team? What have you seen things that have made them really successful and make that relationship very productive? And what have you seen relationships uh, be, well, not productive and sort of antagonistic? Yeah, there's lots of... Um... There's board, board, uh, your constituents of your board can result in antagonistic behavior just because you've got different people with different, different alignment. But what I'm, what I'm seeing is the best leaders who operate a really strong culture are actually communicating that culture to the board. And they're saying very early on to, to their early investors and to their follow on uh, board members, they're saying, we may make short-term decisions that are to the detriment of the business, but they will be hugely valuable to the business over the long term. So we may take an extra two months to hire somebody because we are not going to accept somebody who doesn't fit our values. We take, may take another three months, but we know that if we hire the wrong person, it's, an, it's going to cost us money. And so setting that so tone, having that, setting that tone and that standard and that, that expectation with the board is really critical. Going and saying, we're, we're going to live these values at board level. And one of the, one of the companies I interviewed is a um, company called um, Unbounce. Um, Rick is the CEO. And, and he shares the values and recognition, employee of the month, et cetera, et cetera, with the board. So the, the board knows what's going on with values, with recognition, with reward, with training from a culture perspective. It's a, it's a core piece of the communication that, that he builds into his board pack. So what I'm hearing is culture 
is as important as, you know, some of your strategic initiatives or some of your core like business actions, because it is really the thing that is sort of a catch all for all performance within a team. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there is that classic saying culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, because if you, if they aren't lined, one of them is going to die and it's, and it's strategy. The second, the second one is, uh, there's a, a really good quote, which is, culture is the one sustainable competitive advantage that a CEO has complete control over in their organization. And it's, it's really funny because if it is really the one sustainable competitive advantage you have control over and you don't invest in it and you don't treat it like a function in the business, then it is going to fall by the wayside. It is going to be, 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 be a second-class citizen in your organization. How much time should a CEO be spending on leading those type of initiatives, communicating, making sure culture and, and all of those things are in place? How much time do they spend on finance or sales or marketing? Sometimes there's more and sometimes it's less, but it should be, it should be a daily I look, if you don't look at finance on a daily basis or, you know, but depending on the size of your organization, it should be something that you are thinking about, just like you're thinking about the other important functions of your business. So if you're spending a lot of time on sales right now because sales are dipping, because sales are quite hard in this remote environment, you should be spending a lot of time on culture because people are struggling in this environment. There's high anxiety, there is low morale, there's low engagement, there is burnout, there are mental health issues that are coming down the line in a big way in the not too distant future. And if you get ahead of it, you're going to get you're getting ahead of your culture, you are managing your culture in the right way. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things that's sort of been an undertone to all of this, but you just sort of brought it to the top is the idea of, of using culture as a competitive advantage is like, it is the thing. It is the thing that it can be uniquely you. Like everybody can sell a similar product with different features and that, but there's n the cumulative effect, like everything melded together. It's like just having like a million different ingredients. Only you can have that. And some people are going to like the taste of your gumbo and some people aren't. It's a, you know, a Southern thing. I don't know if they have gumbo in Portugal, but. I, no, way. but I, I love gumbo. And I, I actually, so, so this is the, the important thing about company culture is exactly what, exactly what you said. Plus company culture is, can either be strong and functional or weak and dysfunctional. It's, it's never good or bad. It's only good if I want to work there and I, I enjoy it. But if it's a strong functional culture, it means it's understood by the organization. And when you operate in that organization, it doesn't impact, there's no negative impact. So a dysfunctional culture would be one where there's politics and a lot of backstabbing because that slows you down. But a strong functional culture is accelerating all the time. And as you add more people who fit with your values, they help you accelerate. They add to your culture. Okay. So everybody watching here, I want you to do, take out a pen and paper. And I just want you to write a three letter, well, three or two letter word. If I ask you, is your company culture, organization's culture strong and functional? You put a yes. If it's not, you put a no which basically means like a chicken or fish example. It's either strong and functional, weak and unfunctional. And I don't care what the answer is. Brent doesn't care what the answer is. I mean, he probably cares more than I do, but it's the fact that you have to assess for yourself and it's just a quick check-in. Hey, is it or is it not? Not is it good or bad? Is it strong and functional, weak or unfunctional? And depending on your answer, and you probably want to also ask your team, is the culture strong and functional? Is the culture weak and unfunctional? Uh, just this is a segue, but I think it'll be useful. Going about asking your team about culture, what have you seen that like uncover? What of the the treasure that has come from talking to your team about culture? So yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I guess you're processing that one. <laughs> so so when I when I uh, when I do the the values definition process, we don't we actually in a, in a big enough organization, sort of forty or more people. We don't include the, the leadership team at all. We, we include the team, we, we, the rest of the team. We'll say to them, um, you know, join us, have a conversation about it. Nobody's listening. It's completely anonymous. We use my software to go through this process. And at the end of the day, we have, we have a very clear understanding of the impediments to success of the business because people are prepared to tell you. And then if you design the values and behaviors around overcoming those impediments, you have a naturally, you know, 
functioning system which will which will if we embed it and if we then manage it will overcome the weaknesses in the organization and the dysfunction in the organization but it's it's if you can have an open and honest conversation with your team if the it, it actually if, if there is an open and honest environment they will actually be telling you already that they're not happy with either this person you've hired or that behavior mm. because strong cultures are self-management cultures they manage they, they, they self-management and they are self-actualizing so you can fulfill your potential if things go well and i will manage myself but i will also manage you if i don't feel that you are living our culture yeah and i love that that tool like so from my perspective you know the difference between managers and leaders you know managers are people that have to just jump in and, and tweak and you know there's time for management there's time for leadership but that's why i believe that having a set culture having that framework can be so valuable because it does there's more of them than there are of you and that if, if they embrace it and they buy into it they will not allow somebody to come in and like ruin the good thing they will take it upon themselves because it impacts them more than it impacts you as a leader or as a ceo um that, that gets in the way there so i want to we're a little bit on time here but i do want to make sure we get a, a part if you can just maybe touch on phase three of your or stage three of your model and then we'll we'll wrap up for today just to make sure we have the nice little bow on it yeah so so what we do here is we basically give the organ the leadership the framework and the tools within which to evaluate themselves and evaluate their teams so once we've got the culture the, the, the culture embedded into the leadership team the processes and functions and procedures of the business we now need to keep it going like that and we need to keep tweaking it so we give we, we we look at engagement we look at morale we look at feedback you know how much feedback are we giving and getting how is feedback coming along and, and if it, if necessary we'll do some training around feedback we'll look at you know how the leadership team are living the values according to their team team members so we'll score them out of 10 on living the values and behaviors mm. uh, and we will we will build this into an ongoing process whether it's quarterly or biannually it's got to be at least twice a year where we just we're just taking the temperature taking the temperature and then big analysis twice a year so for, there are various elements that we'll put in to make sure that we're measuring evaluating tweaking learning looking back and and and, and assessing how our culture is changing so going you go from 300 to 600 your culture is changing what do we need to adapt because we've we've, we've doubled our we've doubled our team how do we need to adapt um, and the leadership team are given a framework within which to to deliver on that. Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's it's a continuous journey when growing and shrinking or adapting. You know, it's always having that culture front of mind to be able to recognize as a driver of performance. So that's that's what's happening. So I got one more question from the chat before we finish up here today. Brent uh, Shana asks, uh, how do you teach the soft skills that make up culture, collaboration, feedback, communication? You teach by doing. Um, if the if if the CEO is you know behaving in the right way, frankly, and the leadership team are behaving in the right way, then people learn through that through that behavior. Um, there are elements. So not everybody's good at feedback. So there are different structures, and we built one of these tools into our software, whereby. You can request feedback or you can give feedback in a very structured way which is not insulting or is not going to not going to impact people negatively um, communication is really just from the top down if the communication is open and candid and respectful that's what you will get across the organization if the collaboration is is well documented and is smoothly run at, at, at meeting level at a leadership level it'll it'll filter down but essentially you know your leadership team everybody's watching their manager who's watching their manager who's watching the ceo to see how i should behave to get ahead in this organization and so if the if the ceo is promoting and communicating these needs and demonstrating it then it trickles down yeah yeah it's the game your question Sean. It goes back to the, you got to do, do what I do, not do what I say. And if you live it, people will know. And again, the the culture deck, I think the culture deck is that secret piece that sometimes feels like work, but it's going to, it's, you know, build it once and have it 
go around a bunch of times. So if you can put that in place, I think it'll set the guidelines and then you actually have to back it up with actions. But those two things I think will help all organizations, um, not just scale up in the typical business sense, but really put some, some structure behind their culture and behind what they're hoping to do as leaders. So uh, Brent, anything else that you want to share about that today before we finish up? No, um, not, no, I think you've, we've really had a good conversation. I think if people want to reach out to me, um, they can email me directly. I'm on brett at culturegene.ai, which is culturegene.ai. As I, as I mentioned to you, I spend 20, 25% of my time um, just talking to companies because I'm learning, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student of, of company culture. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Um, reach out to me. My books are on Amazon. Um, and uh, just you know, thanks very much for the time, Anthony. It's been a great conversation. I hope uh, the audience has enjoyed it. Uh, it's been my pleasure. I know everybody liked it. If you want to give some love to Brett in the chat, that would be excellent. Uh, I put Brett's uh, link in the LinkedIn. We'll put his books in the follow-up email that you'll get. Again, be sure to subscribe so you get all of our notifications and sign up for our email list so you don't miss any of that. Um, but today, my guest has been Brett Putter, who is the founder and CEO of Culture Gene, author of two books, Culture Dex Decoded, which I really love that. I loved all of our part, but that was just so cool different perspective on it. And then also newest book, Own Your Culture, How to Define, Embed, and Manage Your Company Culture. Brett, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a blast and it's been a really refreshing take on how to sort of operationalize culture, not from this thing at 30,000 feet, but really like a, as a key driver to, to business performance and leader performance. So thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoy it. If you would like to evolve your strategy with your team, be sure to send them this recording and put actions in place to be able to support what you want to get to in the future. Thanks again, Brett, for being my guest today. I'm really excited for uh, reading your book and learning more about uh, everything that you talk about. So thanks for joining us today, folks. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon.